Scientific theories must make testable predictions. And what strengthens a theory is whether or not these testable predictions come true or not. If they do not, the theory is now falsified. The real battle is over the exact same evidence. We view it one way, they view it another. But why do they view it this way? Their interpretation is that everything goes back in time for millions of years. This is the debate. Which one is true? Evolution or creation? You see, in Darwin's day, there were three camps of creationists. There were the young earth creationists, known as biblical literists, who are us and still exist today. There were the old earth creationists, or day-agers, gap theorists, intelligent design, and theistic evolutionists as we call them today. Then there were the non-literalists, or allegorical or symbolic genesis interpretationists, very similar to how Catholics are today. Many of them were theistic naturalists. So in Darwin's day, the majority of people believed in the non-literal version of Genesis, where the flood of Noah never happened, and God created species as they were, where they were. This is what Darwin focused his attention on, by refuting and attacking the non-literal biblical view, such as the Catholics hold today. Which, of course, he ended up proving wrong, thus winning the war of mainstream biblical creation versus his new theory of evolution, which states that animals can adapt and change in new environments. People just didn't know he only refuted a very strange version of the non-literal Genesis way of thinking. This idea all began long before him, but by Darwin's day it was established and very popular. And this is where the story leads to him going to the Galapagos Islands, which were colonized in the late 1800s. The tortoises once thrived in the archipelago, where there were originally 15 species on the islands. However, since the arrival of people and the introduction of numerous feral animals, four species have become extinct. Darwin wrote about the harvesting of the species of tortoise only found on one of the islands which was exterminated within 15 years of his visit to the Galapagos in 1835. Darwin predicted that within the next few decades, each species would go extinct and be gone forever. Since evolution is so slow, there is no way it could save them. He believed this because he trusted that deep time evolution was true and that speciation was a slow process. Because of this, he believed that the different tortoises on different islands could not mate with one another as they have been separated over just too much time. Darwin believed that the Galapagos Islands broke off from South America millions of years before and isolated the tortoises, each to their own island. What do we know today? Well, recent genetic research has shown us that the tortoises are related to one another and can still breed with one another. And what he thought was extinct was not extinct. And that the species he thought were completely extinct actually were still living on today and their genetics were mixed in with the other ancestry. Today, there are 13 tortoise species in the Galapagos, with more hybrids being discovered all the time. Darwin's predictions based on deep time evolution being true failed yet again. Darwin was right about the role of natural selection in producing varieties of tortoises, however, but he claimed that it disproved the mainstream biblical view of creation. As he personally believed in this non-literal, theistic concept of Genesis, which held to a creation event known as fixity of species. Meaning he believed that God created the earth kind of how it is, and that since there was no global flood, where animals got off the ark, diversified and rapidly filled the earth, that never happened. And since many Christians in his generation also had abandoned the idea of a literal global flood, they were easily convinced and fell away from the faith. People like Darwin never considered the what if it was a literal story. A pair of related species got off the ark and adapted to new environments. That's literally what it says happened in scripture, and what creationists would have believed if they took Genesis as literal. To those who believed the Bible is real history, including all creatures having to repopulate the earth from one location, it would have been a completely consistent finding. The church's allegorical view of Genesis gave Darwin an easy straw man argument to knock down. So did Darwin really debunk a literal creation model of Genesis? Not even close. You can learn more about these sea tortoises on different islands from Creation Ministries International's stunning Darwinian documentary called The Voyage That Shook the World. 
We view things very differently than the evolutionist. We talk about rapid adaptation to environments. There's recombination, gene conversion, chromosome fusions, and epigenetic adaptation. These and possible mutations which can inhibit genes influence the tortoises and why they look different from island to island, but are yet all recently related to one another. And if deep time was true, the evolutionists would be right and they would not be able to mate with one another. And their genetics would show massive amounts of genetic dissimilarity. And yet, what do we find within related species worldwide? Genetic similarity. The exact opposite of what was expected to be found which led evolutionists to make another retrodiction that a global bottleneck must have happened in the past, completely contradictory to what they had said earlier. And here's an image of one of the oldest tortoise fossils on Earth, hardly any difference from those alive today. But a lot of people ask, Darwin was a pioneer, and yes, he was wrong on things, but he got the most important thing of all right, which is natural selection. And that's true, isn't it? Well, I have bad news for you on that front as well, because he plagiarized that from other people. That's right. Darwin plagiarized it mostly from Edward Blythe, which was a biblical creationist. And we know Darwin stole his ideas because they had communications with one another. And Darwin not only took use of his ideas and work, but even special words that had never been used before that were invented by Blythe to describe things now made it into Darwin's book. But he did not just plagiarize him. Oh no, he took the idea as well from other people and mixed it in. This study, which was done at Trent University, discovered that without Patrick Matthew, the origin of species would have never been written. For Darwin took his ideas and also retrofitted them in, expanding on Edward Blythe. Darwin was nothing but a plagiarizer. So his most famous voyage and looking at tortoises is great proof of biblical creation and a complete falsification of evolution. So yes, Darwin got his ideas of deep time from those before him. One of his biggest influencers besides his grandfather Erasmus was a trained lawyer by the name of Charles Lyell. He popularized uniformitarianism, the idea that all things have continued as they are now over time. Does that remind you of anything? It should. It's actually a biblical prophecy about the last days, which states almost exactly what people would believe in these days, stating, all things will continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So by Lyell's single phrase, the present is the key to the past, he just disqualified any catastrophic event in Earth's history, including a global flood. Because he argued that we can only interpret the past through the lens of what we see happening now, today. This is why the education system does not talk about catastrophism and why it's also still frowned upon all these years later. This is precisely what Lyell did. With his one short phrase, the present is the key to the past, he automatically ruled out a historic global flood from the picture without ever mentioning it. He replaced history with his made-up version of it, adding eons of time to the past without any biblical history at all. And this is an excellent legal tactic, as you know he was a lawyer. But is this really scientific? Not at all. It's the opposite of science. It's actually pseudoscience made up of lies then backed by an agenda and disguised as science, but I digress. His comment about the present is the key to the past is purely anti-science. It rules out any possible alternatives for the reason why things are the way they are, because you are not allowed to consider anything other than what we see happening today. That is literally the definition of a dogmatic cult thinking. It's literally putting blinders on scientists and telling them anyone who disagrees or thinks about anything else other than this, that they are wrong. No matter what evidence is presented, this is the modern-day basis for the belief of deep time and slow, gradual geologic processes. He is the reason the masses believe in the fossil record and millions of years today. It's not because the science proved anything like it, and certainly not because it's true. Lyell stated in one of his letters in his journals that was found after he died that his goal was to free the sciences of Moses. That was his agenda. It was all based on a lie. And Charles Darwin, at age 22, fresh out of school, brought only a few books with him. 
One of them was Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology. And one of the things that Lyell said was that if he were to push this as far as it could go, that he could prove that men came from the orangutan. And right after that, what was pushed so heavily in 1924? That's right, there were three fundamental human types, the white, the yellow, and the black, all related to their own primate species. The Asian, the orangutan, the black, the gorilla, and the Caucasians related to the chimpanzee. Charles Lyell with his lies influencing the science yet again, all these years later. So before the 1800s, we have Hudson's book, the Theory of the Earth, published in 1795, that made people doubt the Earth was young. And then we have Lyell's book, The Principles of Geology, which made people doubt Noah's Flood. And then we have Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, which attacked a straw man argument of the fixity of species that was believed by people that did not even believe the biblical creation story was true. And he made people doubt the Creator. These three people influenced all of science that we believe today. And Charles Darwin is related to the Rockefellers. And today, they fund the public school education system. And they are notorious for saying that they do not want a nation of thinkers. They want a nation of workers. And they know that the people will believe whatever the media tells them to believe. And evolution is pumped out to kids and adults on a constant rate. And they admit that even if all of the data pointed to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. So when you're not looking for something, you will never find it. And then they'll claim that there's no evidence for it. Let that sink in. Another problem that we have is atheistic evolutionists today have incentive for doing what they're doing. They also don't want to feel as though they've wasted their life. Not only have they gone through the entire school believing something, that would look really foolish of them to actually now admit that they were duped and fell for a lie, but then they actually paid to learn more of it in college. So that's money down the drain. So not only do they have time and money invested into this, but then they start teaching others. Then they have to admit to those others what they taught them was a foolish lie as well. That puts them in the sunk cost fallacy. It's the phenomenon whereby a person is reluctant to abandon their strategy or course of action because they have already invested heavily into it. Even when it's clear that they should abandon it because it would be more beneficial to them, they just cannot do it. 